This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow Cookie to Range, the podcast of me and Arthur Parkinson. And Arthur and I thought, because it's December the 29th, we would chat about our New Year's resolutions. And uh, I know that's a bit of a cliche in a way, but I think it's quite good to stand back, review what's gone and think what can be better and more optimistic. And I've certainly made a list of three things that I'd really like to chat through, and I'm sure Arthur has too. So welcome, Arthur. Lovely to see you. Hello. Lovely to see you too. So do you want to, do you want to start? <laughs> well, um, the thing that I do deliberately, because I find them so helpful to get through winter, and um, they almost bring spring and summer to the fore, is, is sowing sweet peas. And I think one resolution I'm going to say is this year I really want to grow things that make me smile and make me feel what that gardening is is such a wonderful thing rather than looking at anything that is either tricky or sulky yes and for me sweet peas they are a faff but in a way I love the rituals that they impose on you as a gardener and and the reward that you get the scent and the the cutting mm. there's nothing lovelier so this year I've I've sown more sweet peas than than last year Great. Because I just want the garden to nurture me. And I think in a way that's my biggest resolution. It's sort of taking a step back from the garden away and letting it be a nurturing place rather than a workspace because I have I've, I think I've fallen out of love with gardening in the past year. I think when you're constantly writing and looking at social media and worrying what maybe what people think of, of your style and, and what you're doing and, and putting pressure on it, you you lose the the just gentleness of it so I really want to get back to to just sitting in the garden more and having it as a beautiful space for me and being full of what I want it to be and and not giving a a fig about maybe what anyone else thinks (laughs) I think that that god there's so many things that I'd love to pick up with you there Mm. I, I couldn't agree more I couldn't agree more I actually spent more time gardening in 2023 than I have for perhaps a decade and I just so agree with you. I want to do that even more. So that is my number one New Year's resolution, which is I, I just find that the world is pretty difficult at the moment and it's quite difficult to block that out if you're looking at your phone or listening to the news or whatever. And it's quite difficult to find peace and sort of, I mean, oh, I don't know, that sounds a bit naff, but just be relaxed and kind of in the moment. And I find gardening is the best possible way to do that. And whether it be propagating and seeing things pop up and kind of life renewed, you know, creating lots of plant babies, or whether it's actually out there nurturing and planting the babies that you've grown from seed and staking them properly or picking them or deadheading them or whatever it is. So I created this patch in 2023 and I made an online course with Create Academy, which are those amazing people who you've worked with as well, Arthur, mm. who do these online gardening and interior and some cooking courses. I think they're really brilliant. And it was such a pleasure because I created this 20 by 20 foot patch and I sort of, it was just really, real. it was really realistic for me to look after on my own without any help from the lovely gardeners that we have here. And I just found every Saturday morning, I tend to get up very early and I would go out and I would do three or four hours. And then, um, you know, after the clocks changed, I would go and, and work on it for an hour or so in the evening. And it gave me such pleasure, such sustenance really, and and reward. And I would tend it, but also bring flowers in. And I then was so pleased to watch a program, which I'm sure lots of you have been following, which is called The Blue Zone, with Dan, and I never quite know how to pronounce his surname, Wetner, who's an American, who has been 
studying longevity and the communities throughout the world that have the highest number, highest percentage of people who live into their hundreds. And he he travels between Okinawa in Japan, which has an incredibly high concentration or percentage of centenarians. All these words are rather tricky. And then Sardinia in Italy and then Icaria in Greece. And there's a little peninsula called Nicoya in Costa Rica. And then there's a place in California, um, in an incredibly built up California called Loma Linda. And anyway, one of the themes that emerges as incredibly important to longevity is gardening. And it's not gardening, you know, necessarily with a big spade and in a macho way. It's just the thing of kneeling down, standing up, twisting to the right, twisting to the left, you know, just all that mobility from your core is apparently fundamental. And as I hit 60 this year, obviously I'm not yet 100, but I I don't necessarily want to go on living forever unless I have a good quality of life. And these people, the key thing in these communities is that they have an incredible quality of life. And it's partly to do with the societies they live in and multi-generational and actually interesting religion is quite often a part and volunteering. And anyway, it's a fascinating watch. But the thing that I found very, very cheering was this, the physical ability and agility that you get from gardening. If you just do a little, you know, a few times a week, it's incredibly important. So that was very confirming for me, for your headspace, but also for your physical body, your muscle structure. Yeah, I mean, I I heard a lovely thing, ironically, on on Instagram, which was hummus, hummus is human and soil is soul. And I thought that was such a lovely thing. And then it went on to describe how herbicide and pesticide is all linked to the horrible words that are to do with us, like genocide and suicide. And and that to me really registered. So, yeah, it really, and I think it's so true, Sarah, you know, you know, you go to any care home that's got that's invested in you know a gardener or garden Mm. and particularly the elderly and and the young you know at nursery school where they've got you know maybe a teacher who's got a a gardener and you see people just happy don't you I think yeah so definitely I couldn't agree more it is it's definitely good for us in any and in in any context doesn't have to be professional at all absolutely absolutely and um it's just not facing the wall isn't it I mean I think as one Mm. gets older um, it's quite easy to just think, oh, you know, I'm just waiting for the end, really. And and I think what just being able to get into the garden, obviously, I know that involves being physically, you know, mobile. But actually, by being physically mobile, you're more likely to stay physically mobile. So mm. I'm absolutely not a gym bunny, but it's very, very confirming for me to hear that uh, this that kind of regular gentle exercise has been totally scientifically proven to be better for you than kind of, you know, massive gym action and and hit regimes, um, you know, high intensity regimes and all that. And just that regular going for a walk out into the garden and then actually doing a bit of gardening and using your core. So yes, more gardening is good for us is <laughs> definitely, that's absolutely one of my New Year's resolutions. I, I couldn't agree more. And then another one, I mean, maybe you could just talk through sowing sweet peas, Arthur, because you, uh, I said there were various threads in what you opened with, but, but I know that it is something that is so lovely to do at this time of year to get going with the garden, because obviously if it's pouring with rain or even snowy or whatever, Mm -hmm. it's quite difficult to think of something, but sowing sweet peas is a very optimistic uh, future oriented thing. So why don't you talk us through how you sow your sweet peas? Yeah, it, it really is. And I think what's lovely about a sweet pea seed is it's a big seed, so it, it automatically feels like an easy thing. So I use my root trainers. You get about 40 cells in a root trainer kit. And so one or possibly two seeds into each cell. And I just love the whole thing of either bringing in some soil from the garden onto the kitchen table, onto the newspaper. It all goes and you fill up the cells, fud the whole root trainer kit down so the soil drops nicely into the cells properly and then you can place your seeds to the first knuckle of your finger and um, they get watered and they sit then on on my kitchen windowsill yeah and then as soon as everybody has germinated and everyone's getting to be about an inch tall they go out 
into um, a cloche for me, a little cold frame cloche, or a greenhouse if you've got one, but do protect them from the mice. And also if it's mild, try and protect them from slugs too, because I have lost a batch this year actually from the slugs. Yeah, I think when they're really small, they are quite tasty to slugs. Right. But all being well, they very quickly, even if it's really cold, will will stay alive as long as they've got shelter from the wind and the wet. And they're just a wonderful little brood of plants to be cheering you along through the winter time before everything else starts to wake up. And that's why I love them, I think. And my other resolution that is plants related is to sow alongside my sweet peas some cabaya. Um, because I haven't done that for two years running and we've got a very big fence in our garden and the roses just don't cover it properly. So I really want the cabaya foliage to smother this um, roven hazel panelled fence we've got. So as well as sweet peas, I'm going to do my cabaya, but the difference is the cabaya needs to be inside probably until, I would say, May time. Would you agree, Sarah? Yeah, I would. Because they're much more tender. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, those are lovely things to do. I, I, I agree. Sweet peas and cabaret would be where I'd start. I might add antirhinums as we go in, into February. Uh-huh. I'm in love with snapdragons at the moment. So <laughs> I had some of them in my Great Academy patch. And honestly, I, I sowed them in February. They started flowering in late May. And I only took them out uh, when they'd stopped flowering in the middle of November. I was just blown. And I, I just think that is incredible. So I had a meeting with Josie yesterday about, about the garden and what we were planning for 2024. And we're actually going to make a whole 20 by 20 patch of all the different antirhinums that we can get our hands on. And we're oh, going to do beautiful. a trial because they're just such good plants. And with modern mm. breeding, they don't seem to get rust. I mean, we space them well apart and we grow them up through jute netting, a single layer over the top of them, and they grow up through it at about 30 centimetres off the ground. And they just go on and on and on. And we had one called Cost Apricot that was blow away amazing with really tall stems. There's one called Giant White. There's one called Apple Blossom that smells of dentine, that um, that 1970s. <laughs> you probably don't know it, chewing gum. In fact, you weren't even born then, but it's like no. cinnamon. <laughs> and, and then there's a the whole Chantilly series. So they smell like a bowl of fruit. They're just amazing. They haven't got the double lip. But I am crazy about snapdragons. And honestly, uh, you know, 30 years into gardening, never, never more so. Them right now, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make a twenty by twenty foot patch, and we're gonna monitor exactly which we pick more from, and I'll be sowing those um, in the next three or four weeks, I'd say, the antirhinums. So my my final other one, which is that I think we're gonna do a whole podcast about this, but Adam and I on May the fourth will have lived at Perch Hill for thirty years, so we're definitely gonna do a few celebratory runs around that, but. Yeah, it, it's really good to take stock. And th- and that's what I think 30 years somewhere and New Year's resolutions um, help one do. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start really carefully recording forage for pollinators, bees, butterflies, hoverflies, etc., as well as food for birds. And so every month of the year, I'm going to do a kind of audit around the garden of what is there genuinely that any of those things could still be eating. Because, of course, by January, a lot of stuff has already been eaten by the birds and the bees and, and, and are not yet emerging. So it's not so important. But by February, it's incredibly important for the pollinators. So have I got enough plants and are there lots? And I'm going to get to know my bees and all the British butterflies Luckily, last year I got to know British birds pretty much um, because Adam's working on this book. But it's all going to be about taking stock, really recording carefully. So I sort of get a baseline for the next 30 years. And I'm an optimist, so I hope I'll still be at Perchill in 30 years' time. But I want to record now, you know, what there is in January now, and then think and read about how I can improve it. And then next year will there be more and next year will there be more. So it's taking stock and planning and taking action to make this a more biodiverse, richer, more wildlife friendly, more beautiful and I hope exceptional place. So 30 years back, we've done a lot of improvements, but 30 years forward, I want to do that as well. Oh, that sounds so wonderful because I know there's so much already at Perch Hill for wildlife, but a wonderful thing to do 
and um, properly data it so you yes. can go somewhere with the research and say, look, this is what we're doing. Exactly. Yeah, it's so wonderful. And take time also, just like you say, take time to watch which of the plants the butterflies go to, which of the plants the bees go to, and then put a chair there and watch them. Definitely, you know, yeah. Slow down. I mean, I get more joy out of watching my bird bath than anything else in the garden. Yeah. It's really bizarre. I mean, I've always, we've always fed the birds and things, but I think both of us have just yeah. gone, no, we're, we're doing this, so we're going to watch it like it's, like it's television. Yeah, like um, it's an and opera. And enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely, Arthur. Well, thanks so much. It's so nice to have you back. And incredibly happy new year to you all. Get out there gardening. It's good for you. It's good for your soil. It's good for the spirit. And it's good for the world. Isn't it, Arthur? Yes. Happy new year to everybody and indeed the planet. Thanks so much for listening to Grow Cookie to Range and Arthur's and my New Year's resolutions. It's very linked to the next episode, actually, with Steve Head and the, the whole kind of blue zone thing and gardening being good for us and longevity is going to link in to the next episode with Steve, which is all about gardening being good for the planet. And for me, it's a fundamentally important episode of why we should all garden. So that's why we're starting the new year and it's the first episode in the new year. And that's with Steve Head from the Wildlife Gardening Forum. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.